हाँ
resurrection and the life says the Lord he who believes in me though he die yet shall he live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear we live. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we shall carry out nothing. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord, so then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, 
that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. Our Savior Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Because I live, you will live also. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain for the first things are passed away. We continue with this service of thanksgiving for the life of our brother, Sir Frank Milton Blackman, as we join our voices in the singing of the hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Please be seated in the presence of God. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O Lord our God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you, and may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and the peace you gave to your troubled children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, and by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Honorable Mia Amor Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, Honorable Members of the Cabinet, the Honorable Members of the Parliament, specially invited guests, family members, good morning. We are met in this solemn moment to commend the life of our brother, Sir Frank Milton Blackman, into the hands of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent his Son Jesus Christ to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed, and in whose name alone we have salvation. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you in this community of faith, this chapel, the Houghton Memorial, congregation, as we give God thanks for the life of our deceased brother, and uh, hear the word of God recorded in the Holy Scripture. We will proceed with the service as uh, outlined in the order that you have. 
The first tribute we will have this morning is from the Honorable Mr. Justice the Right Christopher Blackman. After him, we will have our Honorable the Prime Minister Amor Mia Mortley, Mia Amor Mortley, pardon, who will conclude the tribute for us. significant contributor to the success of Great Britain in the war against Germany during the Second World War was the scale of the several thousand code breakers of Bletchley Park, whose job it was to decode German messages and on occasion create false information to deceive the enemy. Every employee of Bletchley signed the official secrets act and from all accounts they all respected that obligation in an article published in 2016 it was reported that at least one couple met and married while working at bletchley and waited until 1971 when the official secrets act was revoked to tell each other what their work they had done there while Frank Milton Blackman was not a graduate of Bletchley Park, he was a devout adherent to the Code of Secrecy and discretion, which was the hallmark of those veterans of World War II. A former Attorney General of Barbados described him as a sphinx, and any attempt to provoke him to disclose information, even on retirement, on the hot issues with which he will be concerned will be met either with a wry smile, a change of topic, an offer of a drink, a puff on his pipe until the pipe was banished by she who was to be obeyed, or indeed all four of the above. Those ministers who first met him when they joined the cabinet in 1976 I interject here, I've been unable to find anyone still around who was there before 1976. Describe Frank Blackman as hardworking and one who paid attention to detail, a confidant and an excellent cabinet secretary, not afraid to give advice, even if it was not what the minister wanted to hear. He was a former Minister of Foreign Affairs, when approached for a comment, said instantaneously, I said this to a few people, but I saw Frank Blackman as a man of total integrity. He was unafraid to tell ministers he thought they were wrong, and as a consequence, he was respected by all members of cabinet. A fellow public officer who retired as a permanent secretary described his erstwhile colleague as someone who was effective without making a fuss and was to the best of his knowledge a rarity that he had no known enemies even when speaking truth to power. Frank Milton Blackman was born on the 31st of July 1926, the third child of Milton and Winifred Blackman. All of his siblings have predeceased him, the most recent being his sister Sylvia, who, the eldest child, who died in Trinidad on the, December the 18th last year. He attended Harrison College, where a fellow classmate, Douglas Lynch, described him as a brilliant mathematician. He joined the Colonial Secretary's office as a long gray clerk in May 1944, was promoted to Assistant Secretary in 1957, clerk of the Legislative Council between 1958 and 64, during which period he had a sabbatical year at Oxford University, where he was awarded a postgraduate diploma in, ad in administration. 
Frank was appointed cabinet secretary in 1966 and served in that post in 1986 and became head of the civil service in 1981, serving until his retirement from the public service in 1986. At the time of his retirement, Frank was the longest serving cabinet secretary in the Commonwealth. From 1980, from 1987 to 1993, Frank served as the first ombudsman of Barbados and continued his life of service to the community as a member of the Association for the Blind and Deaf on his on an executive committee between 1998 and 2000. From 1993 to 2000, he was actively involved in the Royal Commonwealth Society serving as a councillor for three years and a vice chair for four. From August 1990 to 2000, um, to July 2014, he was an honorary Rotarian. The Rotary Club of Barbados recalls his involvement with projects involving young persons, particularly a mock Commonwealth heads of government and a club sports day at King George V Memorial Park. In the late 1990s, he undertook the chairmanship of the Boundaries Commission of Bermuda, which recommended 36 constituencies and one MP in each constituency in place in the former system of double membership. And in the case of one, where there were four members. In September 2002, the committee's report was unanimously accepted by the government of the day and approved by the British Foreign Secretary. A member of that commission, John Barrett, on learning of Sir Frank's death, said the commission was arguably the most important and significant since the adoption of the Bermuda Constitution Order of 1968. He said it was no easy task, and it had the potential to be contentious and divisive. A lot of the credit here goes to Sir Frank and the way he managed the process. He proved himself to be, as I came to know him, a wonderful and disarming man who brought his personal qualities to bear, even-handed and fair with what seemed like an inexhaustible supply of patience. Frank married first Edith Knight in 1958, and they had one son, Peter Anthony, born in 1964. Edith died in 1994, and in August 1995, Frank married Dr. Norma Aswood of Bermuda, a former director of social services in that country, who also later became vice president of the Bermuda Senate. While Frank presented as an austere and serious person to officials and colleagues, he had a mischievous and lighter side, particularly with what I call the Trinidad family the children of Sylvia, with whom you kick around a ball, Lisa, his youngest niece, whom he would tease on a myriad of things, his stepchildren and step-granddaughter, uh, Madison, when he engaged him in Scrabble. In October 1985, Her Majesty the Queen conferred a knighthood on Frank in the Royal Victorian Order, an honor in the personal gift of the Queen. A month later, in the 1985 honors list, he was made a Knight of St. Andrew. After the conferment of his second knighthood, he was for a while teasingly called Sir Sir by his nephews and nieces in place of the more traditional Uncle Frank. I am assured and reliably advise that Frank was a force to be reckoned with in making heavy coconut bread, yam and cheese pie, and an oriental stir fry. Peter recalls that in his typical meticulous uh, manner, his father lined up the ingredients just so for the stir fry before getting to work. More importantly, Peter acknowledges that his father's attention to detail has influenced and informed him when obliged to work with public officials. 
somewhat modestly, but he did have to say that his father, his father's uh, brilliance skipped a generation. And to take root in his son, Simon, here with us today, who early last month, at the age of 25, graduated from the Stockholm School of Economics with a master's in business and management. He is confident his father will applaud that achievement, as indeed we all do. As a young man growing up, Frank was the individual, particularly by my paternal grandmother, whom I was always encouraged to try to emulate. We, the family, are deeply and greatly appreciative of the honor of an official funeral which has been accorded to our relative. And to the Honorable Prime Minister for the warm and generous statement which was issued immediately after his passing. On behalf of the family, thank you all for coming this morning to show your regard and respect to Frank. I wish to thank Norma and Peter for entrust, entrusting to me the honor of paying this tribute to my esteemed cousin. On their behalf, I would also like to thank the caregivers, Clusterine Gittings, Danielle Pierre, and Cheryl Brewster Harper for this listless care and assistance provided over the past few years, ensuring that Sir Frank was as, was as comfortable as possible. The entire Blackman Hinkson family owes a tremendous debt of appreciation to you, Norma, for the loving care, attention, and companionship you provided to Frank, particularly in recent times when his recall of matters was not what we were accustomed to. Frank Milton Blackman, Knight of St. Andrew, Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, Officer and member of the British Empire, husband, father, grandfather, father-in-law, uncle, cousin, dedicated and loyal public servant of Barbados, has left a legacy of service that we who survive him will do well to strive to emulate. Farewell, my esteemed cousin. May you rest in eternal peace. Good morning, Church. There are some people who, by their very presence and demeanor, demand respect. Sir Frank Milton Blackman was one such person. I speak today not just in my capacity as Prime Minister, but as one who would have known his son Peter as a colleague at school and one, therefore, who witnessed him from afar, only to come to office to learn from him from close. And I say so because at this time, as we enter the second half century of our nation's life, it is important that we remember those who laid and secured the foundation upon which Barbados as a post-independent nation has been built. That Sir Frank has been able to serve with such distinction across all boundaries, classes, and sectors is one story and source of inspiration that we should ensure remains for all who come to public life and service in our nation. 
That he was the longest serving cabinet secretary of the Commonwealth is no mean distinction. Indeed, that he could be there to work equally and ably with, for me, the two titans of post-independence Barbados, the right excellent Errol Barrow and Tom Adams, says it all. And that he should emerge from that post as cabinet secretary and head of the public service in the last few years to go to that which the Constitution regards as sacrosanct, the ombudsman, says it all. I am glad today to be able to be given the opportunity to pay tribute to Sir Frank Milton Blackman, not only because of his own stellar service and level of patriotism, but because I believe that by lending my voice to this statement, that I signal to all Barbadians that this is an example whose for us all, that we should continue to herald and follow. I say so particularly to the younger public servants and indeed to my cabinet, because we live at a time when it is so easy for persons to be distracted and so easy for us to allow conflict of interest and conflict of perspective to distract us from what truly is our purpose as a public service. So Frank understood the importance of discretion. So Frank understood the importance of confidentiality. He understood above all else the importance of duty. I ask us today by our presence and by our memory as we leave here to ensure that we hold this Barbadian patriot high in esteem, but as a paragon of virtue. I invite the Public Service of Barbados through the Committee of Permanent Secretaries to indicate what should be an appropriate honor to ensure that his example and that of those others who secured us at the time of independence, Sir Carlisle Burton, Sir Stephen Emtage, Frank Odell, a number of stellar public servants, to ensure that their memory is preserved in the same way that we, we may want to preserve the memory of the political class, or of the artists, or of the sportsmen, or of all of the other great titans who helped build this nation. Public service by definition for public servants has been anonymous, but there is a need to be able to herald those who by their distinction stood out. To the family, I say simply, thank you for sharing him with our nation. His service will always, always be remembered by those who are required to write this history of our nation. And for those who didn't know him, be assured that you miss the opportunity of understanding the very definition of duty and dignity to present itself in the form of a man. I wish you all the opportunity to carry in your hearts his memory and thank you once again for sharing him with a grateful nation. Thank you. May God bless you all. We proceed with the Ministry of the Word. Our first reading is from Psalm 23, that will be sung in the Cremon version, The Lord's My Shepherd, after which we will proceed with the Gospel reading from John 11, 17 to 27. We will stand for that reading.
Mrs. Wazita Noel with the Gospel of John 7, 11, verse 17 through to verse 27. John 11, verse 17. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Here ends the reading. After the singing of the next hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea, the next voice you will hear is that of the Bishop, the Reverend Derek A. Richards, Bishop of the Methodist Church in the South Caribbean District, and the Superintendent Minister of the James Street Spikestone Circuit. Just As I Am Without One Plea.
Let's be seated. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of the Methodist community in Barbados and Hawthorne Memorial in particular extend to the family of our brother Sir Frank the deepest sympathy and prayerful support of the Methodist community. We give thanks to God for his life his witness, and for the legacy that he has left us. Please know that as a church, we will continue to support you in our prayers and with our presence. And please do not hesitate to call upon us in any way that we can stand with you and journey with you through the season of your life, we will be very happy to do so. May God, who is our God, bless you and keep you. I want to share with us a word from Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all these people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Moses, my servant, is dead. Let us pray. God, O oh God, we bless you and we give you thanks that your word never returns unto you void, but always accomplishes your purposes. So it is our prayer today that your word, as it has been read and now as it is being proclaimed, will accomplish your purposes in our lives and among us as a people. Uphold me now that I may proclaim Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Let the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Moses, my servant, is dead. Israel is at a crossroad. They do not know if to go forward or if to go back from whence they came. Their leader and teacher, counselor and guide, their motivator, their strength is no longer with them. There is no clear successor to replace Moses. And so the people are waiting, waiting for a word, a sense of direction, guidance as to what to do next. And God comes along and God makes the announcement that Moses is dead. And not just Moses, but Moses, my servant, is dead. The shortest eulogy you would ever find anywhere, but the most powerful and telling of eulogies. Moses, my servant, is dead. If you know the narrative well, you'd remember that Moses had fled from Egypt after he tried to intervene in a dispute, and his life was under threat. And it was in the wilderness that God met him 
and sent him back to Egypt because God had unfinished business in Egypt. A people that God had called to himself were not free in Egypt. They were oppressed by the Pharaoh, made to build large cities for Pharaoh's comfort and power. And scripture tells us that the people groaned. They cried out under the heavy burden. And it was Moses that God laid hands on and sent Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. God knew, however, that it was not an easy task, that Moses was not just going to walk into Pharaoh's office and tell Pharaoh that God had asked that he release his people. No, Moses was entering into the most difficult negotiations ever. Negotiations against a powerful empire. Negotiations with a powerful king that no other nation was willing to face or object to their desires, their demands. But God laid hands on Moses and sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. If you know the narrative well, you would remember that Moses went to the negotiating table several times, but Mo, um, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, uh, and Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. But eventually, eventually, after persistence, uh, after continuously going, uh, after showing the power of God uh, in the midst uh, of the people, Pharaoh eventually agreed to let God's people go. Moses, therefore, became one of the early leaders of a people who were seeking to find a land and to shape and form a nation. Moses was very instrumental in that task of forming a people into a nation. A people who before that knew that they were related by blood but lived separately, lived in tribes and organized their lives within the context of those tribes. And now Moses needed to bring those people together under one government, needed to bring those people together as one people with a common destiny, with a singular goal and objective. And Moses was great at it. Yes, there were challenges and struggles and difficulties, but he did well. The people had learned to trust him and believe that he was on their side and that he had their best interests. Moses eventually gained their confidence. Even though there were struggles, he gained their confidence and had established himself as one of the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. And even though Moses had not yet accomplished the task of bringing the people into the land that God had promised, he at least brought them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Pharaoh's power, and out of Pharaoh's way. Yes, he had given his sweat and his blood, he had given his strength, he had given his all to accomplish this task. They had not yet entered into the land, but God comes to Joshua with the announcement that Moses is dead. As I reflected on this passage, uh, I thought immediately of Sir Frank, who, like Moses, was called into leadership, was called into service, was called by God to help shape and form a new nation was called by God to help to put the pieces together towards a destiny, towards a goal that God had set and laid before God's people. 
And like Moses, he too endured to the end. Like Moses, he too may have had his struggles and challenges, but he too persevered in the midst of many challenges and many difficulties. And as a result of his work and effort and agonizing was part of the leadership, was part of a people who was shaping something new, was part of a people who was experimenting with something that had failed in other places. And by God's grace, witness many points of transitions towards full nationhood, towards a people established who run their own business. Under God was part of a movement to liberate a nation from colonial rule and from the powers of the empires that ruled the world at the time. Of course, in many instances, no doubt it was like David going out to meet Goliath. But by the grace and the power of God, the David returned victorious in many ways and many instances. And now God announces to us, Moses, my servant, is dead. Frank, my servant, is dead. It is important for us to note that persons like Moses did not enter into this task asking what's in it for me. Persons like Moses was not about himself, but was deeply interested in the people. His own people was deeply interested in the will and the purposes of God being accomplished. And so Moses was not about what's in it for me. And I want to submit that also for Frank, no doubt, he was not in this for himself. I'm sure that he never asked when called upon to serve, when called upon to lead when called upon to get involved, I'm sure his first question was not, what's in it for me? But how can I serve? How can I be of service? Unlike today in our world where we become very self-centered, self-conscious, become about ourselves, and so many persons will first ask the question, what's in it for me? And if the returns are not sufficient, if the returns are not uh, what they expect, then I'm sorry. I can't commit myself at this time. And I believe that even as we reflect on this passage and as we reflect on our brother's life and legacy and work and witness that God may be calling us as a people to come back to the place where we are deeply interested in nationhood, deeply interested in building a legacy for, not for ourselves, but for the next generation, ensuring that the next generation can benefit from our efforts to ensure that the next generation has something to work with. And so it's not what's in it for me, but God, how would you have me serve? How would I be spent in your work, in your service, for your glory and for your honor? Even if it means persecution, even if it means hardship, even if it means death, Lord, how can I be of service to you? Moses, my servant, is dead. This announcement announces the end of a particular era, the end of a great era. But even as God announces the death of Moses, God is also saying to Joshua and to Joshua's generation that even though Moses, my servant, is dead, I am not dead. I'm the Lord your God who was, who is, and who is to come. Even though Moses, my servant, is dead, the vision that I gave to Moses is not dead. Even though Moses, my servant, is dead, the task has not yet been fully 
realize, even though Moses, my servant, is dead, a land is still to be entered and occupied. Even though Moses, my servant, is dead, uh, there is a task that is still unfinished. Similarly, where a Sir Frank has labored long and hard for Barbados, the task of nation building is not yet complete. The task of strengthening a nation under God is still to be accomplished. And I believe that even as we reflect on his life, his work, his legacy, that God is saying to us that an era has come to an end. A man was labored long and hard. A man was given his best for the building of a nation is no longer with us on this side of eternity, but a task is still to be accomplished. A goal is still still before us. A nation is still to be built and rebuilt. A people is still to be shaped and formed for the glory of God. Moses, my servant, is dead. I also like the fact that God could have described Moses a number of ways based on his work, his accomplishments, but God chose simply to indicate Moses, my servant. Because you see, whatever Moses pursued, it was because Moses was in obedience to God. Whatever Moses did was because Moses was following God. The hardships that Moses went through was because Moses believed in the vision of God. Because Moses believed in the purposes of God. And so Moses would be the first to say that this is not my idea, this is God's idea. I am simply fulfilling an idea that God sowed in my heart. I'm simply following a destiny that God has set before me. It is not my doing, but it is God who has called me to lead. It is God who has called me to stand with the oppressed. It is God who has called me to pull down the strongholds. It is God who has called me to shake an empire. It is God who has called me, and therefore it is God that I'm pursuing. And therefore, God affirms, Moses, my servant, is dead. After we have labored and worked hard and received many accolades, after we have labored and worked hard and have been recognized at various levels, the greatest blessing at the end of our life is when God can affirm of you and of me, here is my servant. Here is someone who has done well by me all their life. Our founder, John Wesley, was once asked to indicate something peculiar about the people called Methodists. And after he thought about it, Wesley said, our people die well. Our people die well. Our people can only die well because our people live well. Our people can only die well because our people are willing to give themselves their time, their heart, their all to the well-being of humanity and to God. Our people, Wesley says, die well. I submit to you that our people still die well. Our people still die well as we look at the life and legacy of Sir Frank. We can also declare that as a Methodist, as a child of God, as a child of this nation, he has also lived well, and thank God, he has also died well. Moses, my servant, is dead. But hear what God says next. God says to Joshua and to Joshua's generation, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan. In other words, God is saying to Joshua and his generation, Moses is dead, but the land is still to be occupied. Moses is dead, but there is still a vision that has not yet been accomplished. Moses is dead, but the will of God and the purposes of God are still alive. Therefore, arise. Sir Frank is dead, but a nation is still to be built. 
Sir Frank is dead, but there are many things that are still to be accomplished. What would God say to you and to me? Arise. Arise now and participate in the task that is yet to be finished. Arise now and make yourself available. Be a part of the solution and not just identify the problems. Be willing to offer yourself to God so that the purposes of God can be accomplished. Arise and become mentors to our young people. Arise and stand with those who are falling through the cracks. Arise and proclaim that in the midst of all the challenges that there is good news, that there are people who are still committed to the well-being of humanity. Arise and be a part of a movement that is healing, transforming, renewing, that is offering hope and optimism. Arise, Arise and enter into the promise. So Frank is dead, has died, and so God now asks us to take the baton and to run with perseverance the race that has been set before us. We are benefiting from his legacy and his work. The question is, are you leaving anything that's worth holding on to? Are you leaving anything that's worth building on? Are you leaving anything that the next generation that comes after us can be proud of us and want to emulate us? Moses, my servant, is dead. God says to us, you're in it now. You're in the race now. Let me say finally, Moses, my servant, is dead. A great, great leader like Moses. Some would have wished that he was immortal. Some would have wished that Moses would live forever and would lead forever. But even Moses died. For me, one of the most sobering thoughts is the fact that one day the news will be announced that I have died. Most sobering thought that I have died. And I just want to remind us that we are mortal. And it doesn't take much for us to die. The word of God says, as surely as the Lord lives, there is only a step between me and death. Only a step. My prayer is that at the hour of my death, that I will be able to say like John Wesley, the best of all is that God is with us. And so the question is, are we ready? to face the hour of our death? Are we ready to give up the ghost and to enter into eternity? The good news today is that even though our brother Frank is dead, that death doesn't have the last word because of Jesus. That death has been defeated because of Jesus. In our gospel reading, we hear Jesus declaring, I am the resurrection and the life. For those who are in Christ Jesus, death doesn't have the last word. Death is not final. Death is not finality, but life is because death opens the door into life. I want to challenge you, therefore, to live all your life, one for the glory of God, and two for others, so that your living makes 
a difference. That when history is told, the history will be kind to you. That like Wesley, they can say, you died well. May God give us grace to live well and to die well. Amen. We give our thanks for the word delivered to us this morning and we pray that God will give us grace to respond accordingly. I invite us to join our voices in the singing of the hymn, I Hear Thy Welcome Voice, as we make our response to God um, at this time. We stand and sing.
as we affirm or reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in prayer. Praise be you, O God our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, O Lord, our God, who has overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers, and are seated now at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God our Comforter, who bear witness within us of our acceptance with the Father, and have become the pledge of our inheritance. All praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. We bless you, your name, for the life of him whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and blessings of his life that brought to ours, for his service to his generation according to your will, and for every happy remembrance of his life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness which have followed him all the days of his life. And now the trials of this world are over and death itself is past. Receive him into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We invite the family members of our deceased brother to please stand as we continue in prayer. The Blackman family, could you kindly stand as we pray for you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, you are the Father of all mercies who cares for all your children with an everlasting love. You are the God of all comfort, consoles all those who are suffering. You are the God of all peace who had a promise to pour out your perfect peace into the heart of all your children, especially those who are experiencing the pain and the suffering that the loss of a loved one brings. We come to you now, Heavenly Father, praying that you would become the strength of the Blackman family in this time of loss and be their hope, their joy, and their perfect peace in this time of bereavement and sorrow. Remind them, Heavenly Father, once again, 
that through the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sting of death has been broken. The curse of the grave has been destroyed forever for all those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life. So today, even in the face of physical death, help them to gladly and confidently declare with the songwriter that no guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in us. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand until he returns or calls us home. Here in the power of Christ we'll stand. So Heavenly Father, we pray that you grant this family, especially Lady Noma and uh, Peter and his family and all those who are affected by this death. Grant them consolation and faith, Lord God, in this time of grief and trial, the blessed hope in the coming of your kingdom, the sustaining grace in the fellowship of your people, and make them steadfast in the service of your name and the doing of your will until the return of your son Jesus Christ on earth, our Savior and Lord and our hope for years to come. Bless, strengthen, and console them, we pray, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen thank you Brothers and sisters, we reach to the end of this Thanksgiving service. Even as we stand and sing this closing hymn, and can it be that I should gain, our prayer is that you continue to receive the comfort that you need, even as you continue to mourn the passing of your loved one. We stand and sing joyfully, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood, after which the bishop will pronounce the benediction.
Brothers and sisters, if you do not already have a home church and you're looking for one, I invite you to choose from any 20 Methodist church across Barbados. Hawthorne Memorial, every Sunday at 6.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. And at James Street, every Sunday at, 6, at 9 a.m. and first and third Sundays, there is an additional 6.30 a.m. service. Looking forward to welcoming you on Sunday for Mother's Day. <laughs> Receive the benediction. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, and the people of God say, Amen and Amen. recess. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Zona! 